Hello everybody and welcome to this afternoon's panel discussion on futures for the History Journal Reflections and Projections. I'm Emma Griffin, I'm the President of the Royal Historical Society and I'll be chairing this evening's event. Well, we were motivated to hold an event about journal publishing this year as 2022 marks the 150th anniversary of the Society's own journal, the Transactions of the Royal Historical Society. Members of the Society should have received this year's volume, or will do so very shortly. Uh, my copy arrived here today. Around four years ago, the Society's then literary director, Andrew Spicer, mooted the idea of opening the journal up to external submissions may seem surprising, but until that point, the transactions actually only published papers that had been delivered at the Society's own events. Well, the past few years have been ones of considerable change for us as we make the transition to the much more common format of journal publishing today. This and recent changes wrought to the world of publishing, owing to the open access initiatives, make this a very timely discussion for us. I'd like to start by introducing the two editors of the Royal Historical Society's journal, Transactions. Dr. Kate Smith is Associate Professor of 18th Century History at the University of Birmingham, and Harshan Kumarazingham is a Senior Lecturer in British Politics at the University of Edinburgh. Together, they were appointed in January of this year as Joint Editors of the Transactions and are now responsible for all the journal's academic content. Sarah Knott is Professor of History at Indiana University. She has extensive experience of editing and advising on journals in the US and the UK, having served as both associate and acting editor of the American Historical Review, the US's flagship journal. In 2013, she was elected to the editorial board of the journal Past and Present. Georgia Priestley is publisher, responsible for history journals at Cambridge University Press. Georgia's portfolio includes well-known titles including Contemporary European History, Historical Journal and Modern Intellectual History, as well as, of course, our own journal, The Transactions. And Karen Wolfe is the director of the John Carter Brown Library and Professor of History at Brown University. Prior to joining Brown in 2021, Karen was the executive director of the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Culture, which includes the journal William Mary Quarterly amongst its titles. She's a leading commentator on academic publishing for historians, not least with her regular contributions to the scholarly kitchen. Well, let's get started. I'll encourage, invite the panel to put their cameras on. Thank you. I should also just let the audience know that Sarah um, is in the US and is going to be leaving us around the hour to teach. Everybody else will be here till um, 6.30 our time. Um, well, let's indeed get started. I, we're going to open with a very broad question, and that really is about the durability and the ongoing, um, you know, the, the survival of the journal article format. Uh, the 10,000 word essay seems to have survived um, many different transitions, many moments over the last 50, 60 years. I'd love to know more um, from the panel about what they think about um, this as a format and particularly its durability. Well, I'd love to um, say a few words, even though I'm most eager to hear from the rest of this panel. Um, and also, of course, I want to congratulate uh, the Society on this wonderful 150th anniversary. As I told Emma, I was a little late to our um, pre-session because I was busily reading her article in the latest issue. <laughs> um, and I just want to say two quick things about what I think makes that 10,000 word essay, such a durable format, and then really keen to hear what other folks think. I guess the first is just that, that 10,000 words is about one point fully evidenced. And I think it's that um, imperative to the journal article that is so different from a book, it's different from any other format that we know and any other format that we write in, one point fully evidenced. It's what makes it such a powerful building block, I think, for scholarship. And then my second point is one that I hope that we'll have a chance to talk about as well, which is the way that the journal itself, that a journal, the idea of a journal, is such an essential container that's come under enormous pressure of late as we sort of experience articles in a disaggregated form. But the journal itself is an intentional aggregation of things of common interest and of um, common importance. And that notion of a kind of intentional aggregation, which a library is, the library that I'm sitting in here is an intentional aggregation. I think about commonplace books or life writing as Emma was, was writing about in this essay. Um, 
you know, intentional aggregation is a thing that scholars do, particularly humanists. And I think that journals are intentional aggregations in this really important way. So I think that it's the essay itself is important and also the container in which it sits. Thanks, Karen. I, I, I completely agree. Uh, and just to kind of build on that as well, I think the, the research article, the 10,000 word essay is a succinct and efficient means of communication. It allows space to develop that one point, but it is you know, contained and it's efficient to produce. Um, and that efficiency is only kind of increased in terms of the move to online publication and what's that's, that's afforded in terms of kind of faster publication times which we've seen even more evidently recently with moves such as to kind of um, continuous publication or early view publication, publication online um, ahead of an issue. Um, I think as well, we need to touch on kind of the importance of the research article in terms of uh, career development. So obviously kind of early career researchers being unable to write a monograph, you know, straight out of finishing their postdoc, but being able to write a research article um, and the um, kind of benefits for that in terms of them progressing in their career and getting their first positions um, in research organizations. Brilliant, thanks. Another element that's kind of important is that it fits within other forms of academic practice as well. So of course, the research article is supported by the continuation of the lecture and particularly kind of the 50 minute lecture as a, and seminar lecture as a particular format. And I think the kind of relationship between those two and the kind of development between those two is really important. Um, obviously, Toby Green talked about the kind of history of the lecture and the historical lecture in his recent RHS talk. And I think we could think a little bit more perhaps about the kind of relationship between the lecture and the article. Um, and I think another kind of important point that allows it to continue is that it's really useful in teaching. So it's great with students as well when you're trying to as Karen and Georgia have said, you're trying to kind of get to a particular argument, you're trying to kind of think through evidence. Um, it's this is it provides a really kind of useful way with students to unpick how that takes place and to examine the kind of nature of both argument and evidence in a really focused way. So I think these other um, elements actually kind of support the article convention as well. Lovely. I, thought, I didn't come up with this question to the panel, but I think it's such a good question. And um, it's one of those things I hadn't even really thought of. I wouldn't have asked the question because it just never occurred to me. It's such a, a solid, it's just a solid thing in my life. I, it's never occurred to me that it could actually be different. So it's really interesting. And I love your point, Kate, um, that part of what we do is actually a response to the fact that we work in universities and we teach to students. I wonder if that is really actually part of it as well. Well, that's lovely, lovely way to get started. And um, I, I thought we'd move on by thinking about, um, okay, so we we acknowledge that the, the research, the 10,000 word research article is very longstanding and very durable, but journals themselves have obviously changed and journals are much more than the 10,000 um, word research article. So I just want, would love to hear from the panel about um, how journals have changed, perhaps over the course of your own academic careers. And again, think a little bit about what might be driving these changes and also even what might not have changed that you think ought to have changed. Mm, I'm so I'm glad to, to hop in here. Yeah, that was a wonderful opening question in terms of the, the foil for all the changes that we might be wanting to think about. Um, so I'll answer the question simply in one sense, Emma, which is that um, I suppose one of the biggest changes in the last 20 years would be the journal shifting from the found volume that one browsed in a library um, and that was part of one's obligation to one's field to the unbundled uh, digital um, format that we know better now. And that unbundling is incredibly consequential, not just how we read individual pieces, but how we belong to fields and understand the development of fields, I think. Um, and that's a very tricky, uh, proved to be a very, very tricky transformation, I think, not, not simply um, one of easier access and physical location. Uh, perhaps more optimistically, um, my observation would be that journal, one way in which journals have changed is that they may perhaps have become more self-conscious about the durability of that eight to 10,000 word research article and have been more open to investigating different forms of um, essay, right? So one way, way we might pluralize the sort of historical research essays to observe that we've also had a long-standing feature of the historiographic essay, right? The sort of state of the field essay, um, which when I was at the AHR, was often, um, we often thought of that as gold dust. They were very hard to commission. It was very hard to persuade 
people to spend the kind of time that they might need to write uh, those essays. And yet the sort of lead essays of that genre, like Rebecca Spang's essay on the French Revolution, are just you know, wonderfully important scholarly contributions. So the historiographic essay, I think we can put alongside the research essay is canonical in many ways, but we've also seen experiments in form. And a good example of this would be the, the new history unclassified um, series at the AHR, which very deliberately sets out to break the mold by constraining the length to two to 5,000 words and explicitly asking authors to experiment with form. And so that seems like one good place to go to for thinking about the foils and the alternative that are existing now in this more plural journal form. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think the shift to digital is so huge. Um, and particularly in terms of, as you say, I really liked your phrase there of the unbundled form and how transformative that's been in terms of our reading and in terms of our kind of engagement. Um, and then this shift to using different formats and how that change in convention is challenging us to kind of rethink our practice in different ways. I think another element that's perhaps important in the shift in journals is also the work that goes on around journals in trying to make that leap of communication between the articles and the even the kind of historiographical essays to um, different audiences. So thinking, for example, um, about the blog posts that happen, at the historical journal, at transactions, which kind of explain particular articles or write them up in a slightly different manner, or thinking about um, the podcasts that are also kind of used alongside academic journals now to interrogate some elements of their content. So particularly kind of the AHR, of course, and Journal of American History, um, do this. So that's kind of interesting as well in terms of what that says about who's being communicated to through journals and, and through articles and how that audience is also being seen to be expanding and developing in different ways. I was thinking when um, Sarah was mentioning about the how you had to go to the library and go and see a particular a journal and I was thinking I did the same and I was thinking how so many of our students would probably be horrified at the idea that they physically might have had to go to the library and check just one uh, particular periodical and I suppose that's an interesting thing that I would like to add in the sense that uh, while I was researching as a PhD student and, and earlier on it was there was usually a, a limited number of journals that you would uh, consult or at the very least you knew you had to read uh, in order to be abreast of, of things and in some ways it's um, and and one of the I think um, important and and uh, advantageous development has been um, an expansion of specializations so there's lots of different journals for particular fields although it's imbalanced that's why I was thinking of Sarah's point by there was always had been at least particular outlets that you would read and it's a balancing but you may not have been read necessarily as an author because your field or your topic might not uh, fit in with the the culture perhaps of, of a particular journal but that's so it's a it's a balance i think um and and so that has has changed and something that kate and i have to deal with with a journal that isn't formally a specialist journal, but one that aims at least to represent um, all the different parts of the uh, of, of the history discipline. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Arthur. I mean, it is, I remember when I was an, ad, I know others have mentioned this as well, being a graduate student in the 90s and being encouraged to uh, read the article before and after um, in the physical copy of the journal that you would, uh, that you were looking for. Um, and it just is a very different, you know, it's an article that's rooted in a kind of a physical place um, and it belongs to a, a kind of a particular moment in scholarship and you're kind of encouraged to, to read around it. And of course, it's so un, un, unlike the way we consume our journal articles now. I mean, just one other thing that strikes me as well is it, it was quite difficult. You did have to go to the library and that took time. You couldn't usually borrow journals. So you were standing at the photocopier. Um, so you had to make considerations as to how much you would spend and how much, how much time you had and how much you would spend on your copying. Um, so you just couldn't consume quite the same volume. And of course, now you sit at home and you can just 
you know, download hundreds of articles in a day very easily through university subscriptions. So there's a different kind of volume of material that you're that kind of comes before you and it makes it harder, but perhaps um, more rewarding as well. I don't know. Anyway, thank you for your answers. And I'm not supposed to be talking about my own experience. I'm supposed to be encouraging you um, to talk. And also I should let everybody know we have questions and answers. So if you have questions that you'd like to put to the panelists, do please make the most of the Q&A function and I'll pick up your questions and put them to the panel. Um, but that's one that, that kind of takes us to some of the, the, the changes that have occurred over our careers. Um, what other developments are there that you might like to draw um, attention to? And particularly, there's obviously some difference between the UK and Europe on the one hand and North America on the other. Um, I, I'd like to hear more about how you feel uh, journals are developing and what kind of trends are emerging and perhaps whether there is a, a kind of a national divide to some of these um, developments. Well, um, I think, yes. <laughs> yes, there is. I mean, I... Um when I was working at the Omohundro and um, I was lucky to work with, uh, with Margot Finn and with uh, Peter Mandler at the RHS and just enormous respect for the RHS and its um, kind of commitment to thinking about um, higher ed policy. But one of the things that was the most striking was the way that open access policies could be implemented in a, from a centralized location in the UK, whereas in the US, of course, it's completely decentralized. And one of our concerns there, representing a transatlantic field, was what would this mean for our UK authors? In practice, it didn't mean a great deal because people who were publishing in our journal wanted to be published in that journal to reach their community. Um, but, but yes, some of these national policies have been enormously, I think, consequential and not in ways that people might have anticipated. But I wanted to actually back up just a little bit and observe that, you know, as we're being kind of historians of our profession here, it's worth saying too, that it's not only how we think about, as Kate said, how the journal article fits with lectures and how it fits with these other things, but also that our journal articles are fitting within a scholarly communications kind of massive system in which what we do is actually quite peculiar. And it's um, fascinating that it's had such a long duration, you know, and that it's surfed, that, that research article has surfed a lot of change over time but also that it's remained durable in the face of so much difference in the sciences, for example, which absolutely overwhelm and are mostly driving some of these changes, these national policy changes, which are, are influencing us. I think that's just important to recognize the distinction for us to continue to articulate that. Sometimes when I speak to my colleagues in the sciences, they're sort of freaked out by the kinds of things I describe, like, you know, um, you know, Kate, what you were describing about, you know, the relationship between the lecture and the article, when I've described the relationship between conferences and conference comments and how much work we put into a comment and how an article comes out of a long set of interactions and, and professional convenings, that seems like, what? <laughs> that seems an astonishing thing. Um, so I think, you know, there is this kind of long durée solidity um, with a lot of change around it that's not only internal to our profession and not only national, but also disciplinary. Um, and that, of course, is driven in part by national differences, but in part by the kind of intensity of the world we're living in here, financial, um, global concerns, and um, military concerns, frankly. Yeah, I agree. And I was going to touch on, I guess, the, the uh, yeah, exactly the, the centralized funding we have in the UK, in the Europe as well, and how that makes it a lot easier to implement any kind of mandate. And we've seen that happen um, with Coalition S and Plan S, um, which is not the case in the US, obviously. And that's kind of, I think, kind of a unique situation that there isn't that centralized funding system. Um, and I, I do agree. I think this is being pushed by STM initiatives. Um, in 2019, 20% of history authors got their funding through UKRI, and yet obviously this policy is affecting all UK authors. Um, in terms of formats, we don't really see too much difference between the UK and US. We see kind of similar um, demand for generalist titles as well as specialist, more niche uh, titles. Um, and we also see kind of similar patterns across the Atlantic and the UK um, in terms of the demand for print. So we're seeing a, a kind of a, a decline in the print subscriptions that we're getting um, and in continue a similar kind of uh, increased, um, you know, obviously increase in online access and downloads in that sense. Thanks. Uh, does anybody else want to talk to that? 
Can I just say one thing about print too? I know I'm in, I'm interrupting your flow here, Emma, but I just oh, want to say ahead, that please. how much I still love getting a print journal. And I feel like I'm now so much more self-conscious about which journals I subscribe to and want to hold in my hand so that I can make marginal comments on them and hold them as an individual thing than I was probably 10 years ago, just because it's become more challenging to to see them in that in that format as our libraries stop, you know, getting print anyway. I, I couldn't agree more and I went to the library today and got some books that I could have read online but I decided to lug them home anyway because I just wanted the physical copy and I, I, I still believe I mean, maybe I'm just very old but I still believe you just engage with material different when in a different way when it's down on the page um I, I obviously I use lots of online I consume a lot of online um words as well but there's something about the hard copy um definitely Thank you all. So um, journal articles now. So we've got a mix, obviously, of people on our panel who are teachers, public educators, researchers, and we wonder what the role of the article is as a unit of academic currency, and particularly what changes you're seeing in the use of journals. I think we've touched that on, I mean, your, your comment there already, Karen, about, you know, actually, I do quite like a hard copy of a journal sometimes. What changes are you seeing in your different roles in the use of journals, both um, amongst yourselves, your peers and students as well, of course, as Kate's pointed out, a very big um, part of the market for, for, for material in journals. And I, I could speak to that in, as in myself as a sort of researcher and teacher, which is that it seems to me that of late it's become harder to know what is one's path to a research article. That we've we've become more aware of our vulnerabilities in how we access how we find not access as much as um, track down the materials that we wish to read right so JSTOR used to be at least in my experience used to be a very good place to look for things and then stopped being a good place to look for things um, and that was an unexpected vulnerability because we've come to as researchers come to depend on libraries and subscriptions in ways that were so normal that they were sort of taken out of sight in a certain sense. And then I would say, actually, I mean, this, the particular context of this panel happening right now in autumn of 2022, um, the sort of new vulnerabilities for those of us who've been invested in academic Twitter of having another major path of, to find interest in new research just sort of kind of um, frayed in front of our, our eyes. And so I'm, I'm, when I'm thinking about how I use journal articles, I'm thinking less about the content themselves and how I arrive at deciding that something that I should pursue something um, that feels like something that's under major change right now. <clears throat> um, well, could you just can I just push you on the JSTOR point? How did when when and how and why did JSTOR cease to be useful to you? Oh, and I wish I had a better history of that. I do recall when I was a graduate student at Oxford in the nineties, encountering American graduate students who were shocked that Oxford University did not have a subscription. And then arriving at the University of Pennsylvania and entirely understanding what they were talking about, that it became it was the means of, of finding the right scholarship for what one was working on. And then realizing at some more recent moment in the last five years, probably, that when I made that proposition to a graduate student, it was no longer the right starting point. Yeah. Um, that, that's well, and also genealogies I can offer. Yeah. And no, also JSTOR stopped their current content program. I mean, that 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 made a difference, you know, for publishers, you can't put your current content on JSTOR right now, you have to put it elsewhere. So they'll have back issues, but that, so it makes it not the place to go to look for, you know, the freshest issue. And of course, it is so much easier to find what is being published in your field through uh, the web now really than it was back in the early 2000s. Others? I wonder if the journal article, I mean, particularly in the UK context, perhaps, is actually becoming kind of increasingly important and I'm thinking about this really in comparison to the monograph um, and I wonder you know if this is the case and kind of why that might be whether the particularly kind of around teaching and around ref whether the journal article because it's so accessible and because it can be kind of used in these different ways that we've been discussing whether it's actually kind of becoming more important than it was perhaps in the past and, and kind of what that also perhaps says about kind of people's time constraints and the article is a kind of speedy way in to a histor a particular historian set of arguments or research um so I wonder if that's kind of part of the mix here although in the U.S. context I wonder if that's different obviously with kind of academic careers are very differently 
thought through and work in such different ways there. So I wonder if it's different in the US context. Yes, I was also thinking uh, along the lines that Kate mentioned about how in some ways it's unit not necessarily of academic currency, but in the British context of professional currency, in the sense it might not even be the content of the article, but where you have it might be the difference of getting your interview or not if you're a, um, a job applicant or, or a grant um, applicant. And, and so having it as there is almost a an essential step to getting recognized, even if the content or the subject that the person is um, covering is is not necessarily relevant to the uh, application. Anyone else want to speak to that particular question? This is all very interesting to me because um, um, with the time kind of using research articles, I only get, to, we, I think of kind of usage when you say that. So kind of the downloads and downloads patterns and, and metrics and data, rather than kind of speaking with academics and hearing how they're being used. Um, I can see on usage or downloads patterns are changing. Um, we're obviously seeing kind of wider dissemination of articles with open access. Um, open access articles receive three times the downloads of subscription articles within the first year. Um, so that's kind of a big, I guess, move in, in recent past history. Um, we are seeing changes to usage in terms of different article types. So, for example, book reviews are receiving fewer downloads we see than previous years. Um, some journals I work with have seen around 40% you know, decline in usage for book reviews since 2017, um, whereas kind of book review output might have decreased by about 20%. Um, and that might speak to you know, a, a range of different factors, such as you know, whether you know, publishers are sending out book for reviews, is there incentive to write reviews, et cetera, lots playing into that. Um, but it is interesting. Um, and we do see kind of debate pieces or kind of soapbox articles. We talked about, you know, the creativity or the um, kind of opportunity to be creative with article types. We see those article types sometimes seeing more downloads than kind of the average for a particular journal, um, which is interesting as well. That's really interesting, Georgia, about the um, the review articles. I think uh, as many academic uh, university teachers have a slightly ambivalent relationship with the um, journal, uh, the review article, because they are so easily findable now to students. You used to have to go to the journal. Nobody really read them because you had to go to the library anyway. And they're very, very findable for students now. And they very quickly become a substitute for reading the book. They just read reviews. Um, so that's actually really interesting to hear that they're not being downloaded that much. Um, and obviously, we know there's a decline in reviews anyway, review activity for, for a whole host of reasons. Um, anyone else want to speak to that before we move on? Um, um, I do wonder if there's a way in which the um, research article has become the privileged place in which we talk to one another, right? So if we're at a moment where there's a, um, a lot of change in book publishing um, and the sort of arrival of hybrid books that are addressed to both academic and wider audiences and also trade books as sort of staples of academic potential academic work, then the, the journal article becomes the most precious place in which we address one another and say that that form of address still matters to us. And that, that seems to me very important in a wider sort of capitalist setting where there's a lot of push to more, more, more readership. Um, and I'm quite happy to have a format in which we really say that the profession, the profession's audience um, is, is central. I think that's so true, Sarah, and I appreciate your saying that because um, I think that the pressure for public engagement um, and the that is internal as much as it is external. I think most of us feel very strongly that we want to communicate um, historical findings, and we believe powerfully that history is relevant to the present policy making as well as political events and so on. And yet, also, it's true that we do need to have a way to speak to one another as experts and to evaluate one another's work in a productive way, I mean, in the most productive way. Um, and I think that that question about book reviews connects back to this because we've often used book reviews as a proxy for assessing um, you know, how, how we feel a book is sitting or contributing to the literature. And a decline in book reviews suggests a kind of decline in that sort of last peer review moment essentially for a piece of work. Um, so just to bring that all together, this sort of question about what is our ecosystem for speaking to one another and how is that how is that under pressure now? 
Thank just you, quickly on that, sorry, Emma, uh, just on, on the book reviews, and there's this drive at the moment towards, obviously, open research, which I know we'll dig into more shortly, but um, I mean, book reviews are the original open peer review. There's a drive to that at the moment, but book reviews have been doing that for, for years, and I just find that very interesting. Yeah, that's a lovely observation. Thanks, Georgia. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're going to kind of um, change gear in a, in a few minutes as we kind of move into the second half of the event. But there's one more question I'd like to put to the panel. And there's a kind of a follow up question that's coming through the Q&A about open access as well. That I think would be worth throwing in at this moment. But um, I suppose uh, the original question that we had was about accessibility and readership. And obviously, the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a lot of change in the world of journals, a lot of uncertainty. Um, I wonder if um, anyone would like to speak to what they think is kind of underlying and underpinning this, this kind of churn and this you know, particular moment of change that we've had over the past 15 years um, and what concerns that might raise um, for you in your position as journal um, people closely associated with the work of journals. Well, I think that um, you know there's no there's no question that what's drive what's driven um, the move to open access as a kind of monolithic policy is the same context that we've talked about before, which is the rise of science research and science publication and science publishing, um, which is, you know, eaten library budgets and is driving scholarly communications. It is the whale and we are this, you know, tiny, I, anyway, never mind, I'll, I'll forget that analogy. But the point is that the humanities are such a small piece of this, even as we have ridden the rise of, you know, higher education and, and research expectations in higher education. And, um, much as I love modern medicine, thank you very much. I'm very grateful to it. Um, I think the consequences are very serious um, for how we think about the humanities in public life right now. Um, and the privilege that, I mean, the argument is that, um, that readers should have access to research um, because science should be open to readers, but it fails to think about what that means for the producers of research because it takes science as a model where it assumes that the production is not the problem, but the access to the, the research is the problem. Whereas we often have the other, we have the other situation. Um, we've been producing for a general audience for a long, long time through all kinds of mechanisms. So I think, um, I think this situation is really, is really quite grave actually. And um, I don't mean to be overwrought about it, but I do think that many of the kinds of um, issues that we're seeing in the world, the rise of authoritarianism. There's just, there are many linked phenomena here. I'm not linking open access to the rise of authoritarianism to be clear before anybody loads my email or my social media with that. But I'm just saying that um, a kind of belief in science over the humanities as if they can be disaggregated or a sense that scholarly communication is all the same thing. Um, all of this is, is really complicated and I think quite dangerous frankly, and I think we need to address it more aggressively um, and assertively than we have to this point. Yeah, uh, one, one, oh, go ahead, Georgia. No, no, it's fine. So uh, one point I might add to uh, Karen's observation is also that at the same time, um, salaried um, historians are being asked to play more and more roles as other salaried public intellectuals fall away. Right. So I'm just thinking about, you know, the decline of long form journalism, um, the decline of theatre critics. Right. If we think of our colleagues in literary criticism, there are ways in which more and more is being asked of historians as public commentators because there are fewer public commentators. Um, and so that's another piece of this this puzzle of what we're being asked to do, and where and how. Yeah, I, I think Karen really touches on the key kind of concerns and definitely this has been a massive challenge for publishers, of course, of humanities scholarship to consider or create models where the publication of history research can be open access in a sustainable way. Um, I think we have achieved that or we are working to achieve that, um, particularly through the transformative agreements or read and publish agreements. Um, these agreements are with institutions or groups of institutions and a publisher and allow authors at that those institutions to publish open access. Um, in journals or a collection of journals at no cost to them because the cost is covered by that overarching agreement. Um, and that's obviously kind of, in a way, kind of solved the issue of 
um, the article processing charge model, which wasn't suitable for humanities and is not because there's not funding to support that. Um, and we see that as a positive thing. Um, I think democracy of production is, is a key kind of concern of open access and certainly at Cambridge anyway, when we have kind of our fully gold open access journals, we will be waiving authors who don't have access um, to funding through a transformative agreement or other means to ensure that there's no kind of barriers to producing research articles and I'm sure other publishers will be doing similar but that's you know really really critical and that's what publishers are focusing on at the moment. Let's just throw in a question that we've got from the audience about how the rise of open access and the decline of print um, subscriptions in the UK threaten the revenue streams of smaller and independent journals. So I think, I mean, uh, you're, just as I'm hearing you, Georgia, there's clearly an impact for the producers of research, but also there are kind of, um, there's, there's an, another angle to the open access um, issue in that those were well, revenue streams, obviously, for small organisations and for small journals and how those will, um, will or will not thrive in the new open access world. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think bigger publishers or journals who are published by larger publishers benefit from scale and being included in these these broader agreements. Um, so yeah, I mean that that is a that is a challenge. Um, I mean, personally, I don't work with kind of smaller institutions. Um, so I'm not sure I'm kind of capable to answer that. Yeah, no, great. Um, and others on the panel, just before we move on, is as kind of um users of journals and authors and um obviously Kate and Harsh and um, playing such a role at the moment in the creation of content for journals. Any other concerns or thoughts, reflections on changes um, and the financing model of, of journals at the moment and how that impacts what you want to do? Well, on a positive score, I think one of the um, major changes from my perspective, just as, a, as an author rather than an editor, has seen the idea which, which um, Georgia was mentioning really about first view being able to see something uh, very quickly. I mean, just as a, a, not that long ago, I'm submitting for a particular journal in the CUP stable, and it took, I think, two and a half years to appear after being approved and so on. So the this change in, in that sense, from a, I mean, from a very, you know, from a personal author perspective has been a, has been a real um, positive. Another technological change I think I've found useful is the hyperlinks, which might seem very simplistic, but it's a, it's very useful to um, as a researcher. And I think um, my students and, and others find that particularly useful when they're doing their uh, research, which wasn't as easily done, um, at least finding references before. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it comes back to the findability and just the sheer volume of material that we can find and put our fingertips on there. It's changed beyond recognition, hasn't it? Couldn't agree more, Harshan. Yeah, I think that's the kind of other side of the coin, isn't it, in terms of thinking about just what accessibility actually provides and what it might kind of lead to in the future, who our kind of readers are and how that's expanding. Um, but of course, it then yeah, creates all sorts of problems in terms of the production process itself and how we think through the financial models. And I think kind of George's point about the sustainability is really, really key. So thinking about kind of the next 10 to 15 years, what's actually, how's this actually going to affect academic publishing? And can we really predict all of the ways, um, all of the kind of unforeseen consequences of these changes? I think that's the tricky thing, actually being able to see what's going to happen 15 years down the road. Can I just... Could I say one last thing on this, Emma? Yeah. Um, just, I think I'm not as sanguine as Georgia about transformative agreements and their their kind of broad scale, I, I think. Um, but, um, but also I think um, a major issue here too is that even as we've focused on, for example, transformative agreements with university libraries allowing university-based researchers to find um, a, a way to facilitate their publication, the massive pressure on higher education in just the two places that we're situated in the UK and in the US and the fantastically severe jobs crisis in history, which means there are fewer exceptionally talented scholars who are able to work in the kinds of situations where they are expected to produce research means they are not able really, and why should they participate in that whole review cycle either? So I think there is a labor situation here that is really structural that is integrated with that drive to open access, the crushing um, uh, you know, uh, 
pressures on not just higher education, but on humanities in particular, these are linked phenomena. And I think we, we need to really consider those. Thank you so much. Um, there's some very interesting questions coming in um, in the um, questions and answers. There is, I mean, we do want to reserve some time to very much look forward to some of the future and some of the, you know, the future of journals, but I would like to just throw a few of these questions out. And what I will do is paraphrase them and group them up and people can just pick up on whatever it is they want to speak to. But Sarah Irving, um, says that she is the editor of a journal about and with many contributors from Middle Eastern countries which fall into the lower middle income bracket so they don't receive the waivers that some publishers give to some authors in some contexts and it's a real problem and she's interested in what the panel would have to say. Um, Joe Innes has got a brilliant question. Um, I will might come back to that a bit later as it seems to fit better with our second half um, and David Nash as well actually about referees and about let's start with that one and um, Let's start with that question if anybody wants to speak to that and I'll put Joe and David Nash's questions together afterwards. Um, I mean, yeah, th that is a problem. I mean, traditionally, um, through the subscription model, um, publishers will offer um, journals access to low or low middle income countries through kind of partnerships with Research for Life, for example, through charity charitable partnerships um, and through open access. I think the same initiatives should be taken. So waivers should be granted to those scholars in on the same principle. So um, I think funding for those waivers should be built into the wider publishing landscape, the ecosystem. Um, and at Cambridge, that is what we're doing. And I'd hope publishers, other publishers will be doing the same. There may be scope to potentially kind of ask for philanthropic top ups from wealthier institutions to help support that publishing as well. Thanks. I'm going to put these questions from Joe Innes um, and David Nash together. So Joe says, journal articles are in the course of selection and production subject to more intense critical review than other forms of publication, including monographs. I wonder if the panellists could reflect on the advantages and disadvantages of this. And I think connected with this is David's question as a journal editor. And this was certainly my experience. And um, when I stepped down from histor editing historical journal about a year ago, as a journal editor, I see the biggest threat to the future of the journals is the reluctance of academics to referee for journals can the um, panel comment on this and perhaps suggest solutions um so i think those those two questions are really kind of pulling in you know <laughs> they're talking to the same thing but pulling in very different um directions we can only have this quality peer review if our community peer reviews and it does seem it felt for me a very pressing problem when i um came to the end of a four-year tenure at historical journal um in 2021 um by the end of that period it was really becoming very challenging finding um reviewers and getting the reviews turned back in time and of the, the the detail that was was required um and that kind of undermines the idea of the journal article as something that's been critically reviewed if you can't get those reviews anyway um thoughts from the panel about those um interlinked questions yeah i mean i think peer review is so crucial and it's so crucial to our discipline in in lots of different ways um, we all benefit hugely from peer review, and I'm, I'm constantly amazed at the kind of detail that peer reviewers go into, the time and effort and expertise that they commit to peer reviewing. Um, but because people do it so conscientiously and in such detail, of course, it's also a huge pressure when people have so many other demands on their time. It's unpaid work. And it's going to, and it's becoming more and more difficult to, for people to fit it in. So I'm not, I have no, there's no solution to this, I don't think, um, but it's it's a huge issue. And I think, you know, peer review is is so important also to kind of how we think as a, as a discipline and how the discipline moves forward. So it's something that we want to retain at all costs. Thanks, Kate. Anybody else? And that, one of the things that David asked for was solutions to the peer reviewer problem. I certainly, David, I didn't find any myself, but um, <laughs> I don't know if the panels have any solutions. Well, I, if I may say quickly, the going back to the earlier point you made, Emma, from someone in the audience about um, who's editing a journal of Middle Eastern scholarship, mm -hmm. and I think it slightly links to some of these other points about the, the different spheres, which Karen was mentioning as well, where there are certain institutions that can bear these things and others that can't. And um, I'm sure members here and in the audience have had um, scholars in other parts of the world have, have e emailed and said, could you please send me your article? Because we don't have a subscription uh, to this. And, and, and it's, so it does 
Springer have and have not in terms of access. And in terms of peer review, I think from my perspective, so much of what we do is we see as almost a professional service uh, to our colleagues and to the discipline, whereas we're working, to be frank, in a commercial environment. And so that these uh, journals aren't done for the out of the goodness of hearts, or at least from the publisher's perspective. And yet we're expected to do this from the goodness of our hearts. Thank you. Um, I've got too many screens open and I've lost the one I want to go to. Thank you, Harshan. Um, I liked your, your comment there, um, Tom, about wasting too, spending too much time reviewing for the RAF and not enough actually helping to produce knowledge. But um, I think as Harshan says, we're in an increasingly commercial um, university environment, certainly here in the UK, and it, it affects so many elements of our work. But it's very easy to sit around and get very um, gloomy um, and negative and pessimistic about everything that's wrong. But what we would also like to do um, in today's um, session is think a little bit about the future of journals um, and um, really think about how we might, you know, what role, how we might want to see them developing and the role that our editors and publishers here on the panel have in shaping the future of journals. Um, I wonder if I could um, turn first to you, Kate and Harshan, because obviously we made this change um, to the transactions, which is to open it up. And it's um, quite, quite quite unusual to be kind of effectively launching a new journal um, at the moment. I don't know if people are doing it all the time, but I mean, it's it, it, you know, it's not something that happens every day, um, but it's a moment of kind of looking forward and for change in the future. And I'd love to hear more from both of you or either of you as to how you would like to see, um, you know, how you would like to see a journal change and grow in the future. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, I mean, so the transactions has been under so much change in the last few years. And hopefully, as Emma mentioned, you've all received your new copy of the transactions and you can see some of those changes in action. Um, and you'll find in the first essay, the president's address or the president's kind of article in the in this issue of the transactions that Emma actually sketches out the nature of those changes that have been taking place. And as Emma said earlier, you know, we've moved from a system in which the articles that appeared in the transactions were those that were developed from invited lectures and from prizes awarded. And then with this year's volume, we see the kind of opening up of the transactions to submissions from historians around the world, which is a really, really significant shift to be taking place in this, the 150th year of the journal. Alongside those changes, of course, we've also seen the changes in editorship. So Harshan and I um, are appointed as co-editors for transactions, and we work alongside a UK editorial board and an international advisory board. And we'd like to take this moment to really thank everyone who's on those boards for their contributions and support over the last few months of, as we've been thinking about the changes that we want to make at the journal and how we want to kind of open things up much further. You'll also notice, of course, that the look of the journal has changed. And, and in this kind of world of social media, that's, that's the aesthetics of these things is also important and signals the way in which things are shifting. Um, and as Harshan mentioned earlier, we also, um, thanks to CUP, have the ability now to show articles through first view once they've been accepted and have been through the production process. And this is particularly important for the transactions because we remain a one issue a year journal. So the fact that scholars and, and our community of readers can actually um, see this research as it comes out is something that's really wonderful and we're really kind of pleased to see that shift. So alongside these changes, we're also thinking, Harshan and I and the boards are also thinking a lot about the intellectual parameters and the focus of the journal. And we've been led by certain models and examples of good practice. And we've been particularly kind of recently been thinking through the changes that are taking place or have taken place at the American Historical Review. Um, Obviously, the, the conversations that the American Historical Review, the conversation articles the American Historical Review has been doing for a long time, since 2006, are really important. And the, the recent shift to including kind of the history lab. So thinking about the experimental forms of work and methodologies that are taking place in our 
field and how do we actually find formats that allow people to communicate that so that's been really useful for our thinking um, also things like the history workshop journals virtual issues how can you is particularly useful for transactions which has a huge kind of back catalogue so how can you kind of make past and present research talk to each other in different ways and also things like the journal of colonialism and colonial history their use of round tables to talk through contemporary issues and some of the historical significance and um, legacies of them has also been important to our thinking so that's the kind of changes that have taken place and harsh and i think is going to talk a little bit more about what our aims are now how they've been formulated and how we're seeking to meet them going forwards Thanks, Kate. Hey, um, actually, Harshan, could I um, just ask if Sarah would like to um, slot in before you speak? Because I know she needs to leave us for a teaching yeah. commitment. Let me come back to you, Harshan. Only if you want That's to. That's so Sarah. gracious, Emma. Thank you. And I, I do apologise for having to rush off at what is my 1 pm um, to teach. Uh, so Emma had asked us to think looking ahead. And I will, I'm going to pluck my favourite thing for looking ahead and, and just say that and put it in the, in the chat as well before I, before I head off. Um, one feature of, of um, discussion among historians that I've really appreciated in recent years in the United States is a really robust uh, conversation about uh, citational practices. And I wanted to frame citational practices not as sort of epiphenomenon, but actually content. Um, right, we've been asked to think about the sort of future topics and content of journals. Um, there's been really good work done on the under citation of women and people of colour in historians' scholarship. Um, and a group of scholars who are all in the field of environmental history wrote up a piece that really reflected on, if so, what can journals and authors do about it? And they came up with a whole series of proposals about how we might reframe citation practices in terms of content that properly recognizes neglected and um, excluded forms of intellectual thought from the past. So I'm going, I'm going to actually just put a reference to that piece in the in the chat because it's a really lovely short form uh, essay, not a, not a research article, that I think excavates a lot of the kinds of commitments we might want to have going forward. So yeah, thank you for that pause, Emma, I appreciate it. And I will I will sign off in just a moment or two. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Um, and back to you, Harshan, sorry, sorry about that interruption. Don't be silly, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks very much. Well, linking to um, Kate's um, ideas and perhaps also linking to Sarah's in terms of having different types of um, content um, in, 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 in every sense of what that of what content means. Um, Kate and I came up with three main aims that we're very keen to uh, push forward, which and the first one being to reflect the full diversity of geographical and chronological areas um, at stake in the field. So to so that it isn't is because we see our uh, the transactions our journal as being one that is should be a home or at least accessible to all the different fields um, of history in all different regions of the world so it would be to try and encourage uh, that our second aim is to show the dynamic um, nature of the field in terms of not just having in some ways the set piece or set type of article but also ones that may bring different methodological or conceptual um, ideas, and as well as, um, as, as uh, Kate mentioned earlier, having different um, formats that may not, going back to our first question, may not fit the traditional 10,000 word um, article, but yet alongside that, so it won't be that we're <laughs> getting rid of it, but having other types of formats that might um, suit things such as debate pieces, round tables, longer reviews, maybe um, discussing a certain work, but not um, in a in a review. But it's the main thing is in some ways to show the the different dynamisms that are available and apparent in the in the field. And the final um, area uh, aim that we have is to reflect the ambitions of the society itself, the Royal Historical Society, in terms of its commitment to inclusion and diversity within history. Um, so that means having, taking full advantage of the word representative uh, and what that means, not just in a scholarly sense, but also in, in different sectors of the discipline um, and, and all that means, especially since it had been the format before, 
there had been, uh, you know, I suppose, a, a natural preference or a natural entry of pieces from uh, those in more senior positions in the profession, whereas this is to try and get you know as many different types of um, scholars as well as people outside the formal university system as well to uh, contribute. So those are our aims. They're ambitious aims, uh, but we're we're hopefully through events like uh, today's and through our boards and through our website and thanks to uh, CUP's promotions and, and through conferences and so on to try and um, see some reality come with those aims um, and we, we hope that you will all help us with those. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to just extend this um, particular um, query about the transactions just for a moment longer and then there's quite a uh, quite an interesting provocation in the um, chat from David Phillips as well that picks up on a point that you just made harsh and for Tom Cutterham first of all um, with a very great deal of respect to both journals what would you say will be the difference between transactions and past and present under the new regime for the former well I will say Tom if we can um, uh, if we can emulate in any way the wonderful work that past and present does, um, we will be thrilled. Um, but we'll, over to um, Kate and Hart, if you've got any thoughts about that. Well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, past and present does a brilliant job and um, it's a great model for the publication of historical research. I think transactions is slightly different in terms of we actually have a we do have a kind of wider scope. I think past and present has a slightly more focus on kind of social and cultural histories, um, whereas the transactions is, is there in some ways to kind of represent and try to embrace all different parts of the field. And this makes it a huge challenge um, to edit and kind of think with. And Harshan and I are, are kind of deeply thinking about that at the moment. But I think I think that's quite I think that is a distinction. And I and I think that's a, the kind of challenge that we face. Thank you. I have lost all the um, Q&A. And there we are. There, there we are. Um, thank you. So the other um, thought, uh, question I thought would be quite nice to put to you now is from David Phillips. As a non-academic contributing to some reasonably good quality history journals, your panelists' comments seem depressingly inbred um, academic ecosystems. I hear much about academic advancement, little about the advancement of knowledge. Much peer review is bracing and challenging, some is slovenly and prejudiced. Is it time to recognise that journals are primarily for the university library and move on to more productive occupations? What do you want to comment on? Well, that's an interesting question. I think in one way, open access serves to try and address that. If we're thinking of it from a humanities perspective, it's making that research more accessible. And the aim of open access, I think, in one sense, is to move research beyond the academy, beyond academia, and engage the wider public um, in kind of academic discourse and historical discourse, um, which I do see as a positive thing. Um, we see that in our statistics, you know, and earlier, I think it was Kate mentioned kind of blog posts and accessing in that sense. Um, we look at our metric scores kind of mentions on social media and see um, academic scholarship have an impact in that way and um, kind of beyond the traditional journal format. Thank you. Okay, let's um, go on. Um, future topics and content forms for journals. What's not being done that you would like to see? Um, any uh, thoughts from the panel about that? You know, we have effectively touched on that. Yeah, and I think there's so many different um, possibilities, aren't there? And I think, you know, Harsh and I have, of course, been thinking about this a lot over the last few months. And there are other possibilities, I think, for journals to take on. You know, one would be, of course, the how do we go about the work of actually enhancing and including digital the digital aspects of articles? So how do we make the journal article? Would we want to make the journal article much more of a kind of multimedia presence what would that be if it was such could we link could we provide kind of more links to online sources to video to audio and what would that mean for particular parts of the field that actually could really you know having journal articles do that would be really really helpful 
Um, I think, you know, other possibilities are also thinking about kind of long form articles. As we talked about before, we're kind of, we are quite wedded still to the 10,000 word article. And I wonder to what extent those conventions also shape the way in which we think about arguments and ideas. I wonder whether we think in our, in 10,000 word articles sometimes and whether we could actually, what would the longer form do? How might that kind of interrogate the way in which we think and the way in which we work? Um, and I think kind of more broadly, you know, we could think about how our, how journal articles, how these different formats do shape the nature of our research practice. And I think sometimes we don't think enough about how the off and we don't interrogate the forms of writing that we use and how these shape the ways in which in which we work. Um, so there's lots of yeah, there's lots of different ways. I think multiple author articles is also the kind of a question in humanities that we haven't kind of touched upon yet. So we might also want to kind of touch upon that in our discussion. I think um, there's so many. There's obviously there's so much that is uh, that is missing. I think we're all um, sort of uh, aware of uh, how. Uh, sort of constrained in some ways. It, nonetheless, the exciting profusion of historical research still feels constrained to us, both in terms of um, the kind of the, the genre in which we work, the formats, the technical capacities. There just there's so many different ways in which I think our imaginations can move us forward. Um, at uh, at the William and Mary Quarterly, we designed um, a platform for digital um, publication that included kind of multimedia and um, sort of non-linear presentation. I'll just put that in the chat, um, the link to the open piece of it. Um, and it was quite exciting to see how scholars would create digital, born digital scholarship essentially, and how that could be moved through a traditional peer-reviewed publication process. Um, I think the, the outcome is really interesting, but the process of the journal Think and the field really thinking through how this would work was equally rewarding. So um, anyway, I'll just put that in the chat here. Thank you. Um, I well, we had um, so we 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 did invite the um, attendees to send questions into us before the event as well. And there are another um, couple of questions that did come in about. Um, the labour, um, you know, who's doing the work and, and the labour behind um, the production of the journal, which I'd just like to put to the panel at this point. So one was from Emma McLeod, editor of Scottish Historical Review, and she says one challenge is for book reviewing as an aspect of journals work, the unwillingness of both book publishers to offer hard copies of the books for review unsurprisingly leads to oops, spinning around um, the unwillingness of academics to review the books given the labour involved. This has been a useful function for journals that is increasingly difficult to maintain. Um, and also on the theme of um, getting people to do things for journals, Sarah Austin writes, elaboration of another question, how can journal editors, staff work together to document the uncompensated labour upon which journals rely? How do we compensate so that scholars without guaranteed salaries, for example, can afford to provide the work for journals. And I think that also kind of um, links back to um, David Phillips' question earlier um, about who journals are for and, and how they can serve communities outside um, the university, given that the work of the peer reviewing, um, difficult as it is, um, one might make the case that by virtue of being employed by a university, it goes with the, the, the job to some degree. Um, so a, a kind of a few linked questions there for the panel. To start on the book reviews question, I mean, I absolutely believe that publishers should be sending hard copies out for review. Um, book reviewers aren't paid for their work. The book is the payment, and so publishers really, really should be doing that. Um, I can see why publishers are moving, some publishers are moving to not doing that. Um, and it's because of, in part, the move to open access, but the general kind of broader trend of there being less money in the research publishing kind of ecosystem. There's, there's less money going to publishers and that journals are receiving kind of like less revenue but, um, because of that. And so there's kind of increasing pressure for publishers to kind of consider costs. Um, I'm not excusing that, but I think that's a factor into why some publishers are making that, that decision. I think there's, I, I just wonder too, whether, um, you know, the hard copy is sort of been considered as, as payment, um, but also the hard copy, at least for some of us, I don't think this is just a generational thing because my graduate students tell me they feel the same. 
that it's very difficult to fully engage with the book that you're reviewing if you only have access to it online. Um, and there are technical ways that we could facilitate our engagement through annotation software and other things, but still um, the long evolution of our brain's relationship to the codex, I think, um, means that the hard copy actually facilitates review. It, it doesn't just reward review, but it actually facilitates it. So if I'm asked to review something, but I only have the digital copy, I confess that I've often found a way to get the, the hard copy. Thank you. Um, so other future challenges, thank you so much, everybody. Um, so other future challenges really for the for you know, looking forward to the next five to 10 years. Um, we've already touched to some degree on open access, but um, would the panel like to speak more about the implications for journals and users in the UK open access? And um, Karen, you might be able to update us a little bit about what's going on in the US because you have, as you've already mentioned, followed a very different path there. And I think many of our um, listeners would be interested to know how that's unfolding over there. It's really fractured is the is the short answer. I mean, I think um, I think you know that in the UK, there's, there's still a divide, um, some tremendous successes with open access humanistic publication. Um, and yet there's still a sharp divide between STEM and HSS. Um, publishing in terms of, of OA. And um, I obviously you can sense that I'm very ambivalent about pushing HSS to you know, achieve more in that as opposed to other things that we could invest our resources in. But in the US, it's just even more fractured. Um, and for the most part, um, we see that some universities have transformative agreements with some publishers, but these are still largely STEM. So it's just still a kind of a minority situation. The other thing that I just wanna raise that I think is quite important for us to think about is that it's not only a STEM HSS divide, but that it's a divide within the humanities in terms of disciplinary perspectives. So I think about my colleagues in literature, for example, for whom book publication is still the, um, the kind of apex publication and yet um, book publishing in that discipline is under even more um, economic pressure than it is for history. So even within disciplines, the economic pressures and the business models are so different. To come back to your question, Emma, about small society journals, I see small society journals in disciplines other than history in even more distress out of the kind of OA push um, than history. So. You know, I wonder actually whether we are at a kind of moment of, of turning back towards thinking about distributed um, economics for publishing as we're all more aware of the kind of community labor that is involved in review and in exchanging research and producing research. I think the conversation we've been having and the questions in the chat tell us that we understand that all of this labor is now happening in large measure outside of university financed positions, and it has been for a while, and it, if we move forward, it's going to be. So I wonder whether we're going to turn back towards more distributed um, financing than the open access mandates have been have been requiring. We shall see. Thank you. Uh, Georgia, have you got any comments there? Don't worry if you don't. Um, no, yeah, I mean, this is a pivotal time, and I mean, and certainly as a publisher, we are very much responding to mandates. Um, Cambridge is at the forefront, and we've been really trying to provide accessible routes for authors to publish open access, given the mandates. This year has been really crucial in the UK, um, as we all know, um, in April of this year, with UKRI implementing their open access policy, meaning that all UKRI funders have to find a route to publish open access. And so we've been doing everything we can to facilitate that. Um, at the moment, still, the majority of history journals are operating on, on a hybrid model, so publishing open access and subscription content. Um, and this has created a degree of inequity, um, which is problematic with some authors with you know, access to transformative agreements or funding able to publish open and receive kind of the benefits of that, and some authors not. Um, and so that's why kind of we're driven to move past that as soon as feasible to kind of create a fully open access portfolio and to build kind of waivers for all authors to publish um, in that model. Um, but yeah, there certainly are challenges on the horizon. Thank you. And I'm I suppose 
question on um, from Joseph Clark in the Q&A and um, we are aiming to finish at half past the hour so if you have any questions do pop them in the Q&A and I'll try and feed them to the, to the panel and um, just picking up on that he writes is there a risk that read and publish agreements and of course it links very much what we've been saying about other formats for the journal is there a risk um, they will only fund research articles but not necessarily other types of work that journals regularly publish review and review essays uh, book reviews for example um, how will the financial implications of OA OA work um, to reshape, in fact, to reshape the content of the journal. And I think, I mean, it's a, the, a lot of the OA is a big story in, in unanticipated consequences and unintended consequences. But I just wonder, any thoughts about that? Because we do obviously have, certainly in the transactions, um, lovely ideas to redevelop. And I wonder if the funding regime is going to um, pull away, uh, you know, kind of pull in, the, pull in the opposite direction to some of the things that we might like to see in the world of journals. Well, this is certainly another big challenge. And I'll, I'll just start by saying, I think I see my role as publisher as ensuring that business models do not interact with like editorial independence. Editors should be publishing what whatever they want that serves the community best. And it's the publisher's job to make sure that's workable from a financial perspective. Um, and that's correct that non-research, what's termed non-research, so book reviews, for example, are not being funded for open access publication. Um, longer review articles are kind of any article that's lengthy or contributing some kind of new argument or new, um, I guess, a contribution to, to scholarly discourse is covered for open access funding. But book reviews, for example, are not. Um, and that is a problem. That, that's something kind of publishers are working to address um, at Cambridge because we're not being pushed to make that content open access. We will be keeping that behind the paywall in a subscription form. Um, once the journal does flip to become fully open access, um, we're still working out how that looks, um, but we see that as the only, only feasible way to deliver that content. If we waive that content in an open access market, we're conceding that it has no value, and that's something we're not willing to do because we see that content as having value. Thank you. And I'll just throw open, throw in um, Bob Shoemaker's question as well at this moment. We've had frequent references to the economies of publication. Isn't one way of addressing this by reducing the cost of publication through the use of digital only publication, camera ready copy? These are inexpensive to produce. I mean, my feeling is there's, that there are expenses to creating, if, you know, whether it's Kate and Harshan or the peer reviewers, or there are expenses. It's not just about the publication costs. There are a lot of hidden costs. And I think that's partly what's coming through um, in the panel today is there's a lot of labour that goes into producing good quality journal articles. And the format of the publication isn't necessarily going to be um, an answer to all of those costs. But I just wonder if the panel have any any thoughts on that, whether, whether we can kind of change in some way um, the publication or the appearance of the, 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 the journal in a way that makes it cheaper and therefore more accessible. Um, I, sorry, go on, Kate. No, no, you go, Georgia, you go. I say, I mean, obviously, if a journal was to move online, we would see kind of cross decrease because print and distribution costs contribute a lot to journal cost. But there's so much more there. And even we're seeing kind of increased costs with the move to online and what that means. Um, so some kind of obvious costs would be marketing costs, obviously uh, production costs, editorial costs, um, historical articles are obviously lengthier than quite a few different articles and they require like the highest quality of copy editing, for example, and editorial intervention um, post acceptance. Um, but other kind of costs would be, you know, online peer review system maintenance and management. And that's really important in terms of upholding peer review integrity, but also in facilitating the publication of open access material and um, kind of online platforms for authors to sign their um, license to publish agreements online um, whole operations teams who are working to facilitate the kind of flipping of journals to full open access and what that means for workflows and kind of infrastructure. Um, ethics teams who help, you know, we increasingly with the move to online have seen more attacks on kind of journals in terms of paper mills or other kind of manipulations of the peer review process. And ethics teams are really kind of crucial in that, um, as well as legal advisors for kind of licensing permissions queries, and not even to mention kind of all the costs that go into hosting you know, an article online, the metadata tagging, the creation. We've talked about multimedia elements, you know, how to kind of facilitate those. So there's definitely kind of a lot of costs associated. I think um, if there was a way to kind of cheaply publish a PDF online, people would go for that option, but people see value in publishing in journals. Bravo. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I think that was such a, thanks Georgia, because it really, highlights just all the different forms of labor 
that are in, and all the different costs that are involved. Um, you know, we haven't, one thing we haven't kind of touched upon and which is sort of in the background here is also thinking about some of the kind of ecological footprints of this work and how do we also kind of bear those in mind. But I think absolutely, as you've outlined, just the labor and the technical expertise is is huge in creating in creating and producing these things. A colleague of mine, um suggested that maybe at the end of every historical research output, whatever it is, we should have credits that roll like a film where we show who was the copy editor, who was the managing editor who reviewed, who was the publisher, who, you know, except, you know, because there's, it's so, it's so intense, really, the amount of collaborative labor that is produced, never mind the archivists, the catalogers at a library, the librarians who acquired the materials on which it's based, so much collaborative labor goes into these products. There is also so much labor that goes into the writing of a journal article and we are usually able, many of us are able to provide that labor because we're salaried academics, but there is a massive amount of labor that goes in and also needs to be um, considered in some way, but even before it, before it ever hits um, an editor's attention, reaches an editor's attention, there's a lot of labor that will have gone into it. Brilliant. All right. Other thoughts about uh, challenges? I mean, clearly it is a challenging um, moment um, in the world of journals. Anyone from the panel like to speak anything more about particular concerns they have? I'm just going to quickly say that um, I'm sure it's the same for the other um, UK panellists, that the, the our institutions very rarely recognise any editorial or reviewing um, efforts. And, and you, we might say, as you mentioned we are salaried academics but nonetheless in our professional engagement with our line managers or the university itself there's seldom any um, allowance or recognition I'm not talking about a financial one mainly time actually uh, to do these things and and I, I don't know if Kate's had this but I had several several colleagues thinking oh you must get a, a certain buyout or something of your normal responsibilities at Edinburgh because you've got this new <laughs> that there was no such thing um, um, happening and I think that's and I, I know I'm not alone and so if you take it on to a more smaller level although it's, it's bigger in other sense of doing reviewing and reviewing perhaps a second piece that has been already revised and these things are you know it's not just the financial aspect but the the time one and whether how much you're institution uh, values and recognizes um, those elements of our professional job. Yeah, Harsh, I, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, we've been focusing a lot on all of the changes um, in the kind of the publishing side of things, but I think us um, in UK academics are also occupying a very different sphere. When I first started doing um, journal editing, it was 2010, which was before the lifting of the, the student cap and the fees cap and um, before the kind of the, the introduction of the market to universities. Um, and I think it was much easier for people to say this is part of my scholarly um, responsibilities and it was much more likely the heads of departments would recognise um, that this labour needs to be done. And it seemed to be much easier, certainly, to get um, peer reviewers at that time. And we're now in a much more kind of um, cutthroat and commercial uh, sector and of course we you know the the, the 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 modes of operating around journals and peer review and the values there haven't changed but our jobs have actually changed quite a lot so I think that's definitely um something that we might be able to see a bit more clearly in 10 or 15 years time but at the moment we're, we're living through it and it's really difficult um okay so we've got a few minutes left um just a, a couple of um slightly more fun questions um and I did notice some things coming in at the chat I'll throw out some of the fun questions and just see if there's anything um to pick up in the chat but first of all if you were setting up a history journal now what would it what would be its focus what do you think we need thoughts on that I'm sure Kate and Harshton are not in the space to be um, launching a new journal at the moment because they're taking on an old journal and trying to do it in new ways but um, there's a kind of um, an open-ended question for you nonetheless if you were not doing this. Um, this is an interesting question for me because this is part of my job is kind of considering new journals to launch and considering proposals. Um, I think it would just need to serve an important purpose um, in terms of topic as publisher, I would look at data in terms of like topics and trends and to see what's kind of emerging, what's what's popular, where, there, where is their demand. But that's quite useless without speaking to kind of academics in the field and, and hearing from them and what, what they need. 
Um, I think if we could publish in more languages besides English, that would be beneficial. Um, I think upholding diversity of perspective is crucial and kind of embedding that into journal policy is crucial as well. Um, and obviously ensuring kind of the accessibility and for authors to publish in an open, open access landscape as well. I would, um, in the fantasy world of a new journal, I would love to see some kind of um, a platform that allowed us to have real community engagement, either through enhanced annotation software. I, I really admire many annotation softwares, uh, software, but much annotation software, but I think I haven't seen anything that would really encourage me to jump in and have engagement, but it would be so great if we could have actual multilingual capacity in journals so we could cut across national borders and actually if we were able to and linguistic borders and we were able to really publish in a kind of global way. Um, I think all of the data about all scholarly communications, whether it's in our field and discipline or across humanities or across scholarly publication shows that it runs towards the global north and we would like to, obviously we should have more global um, representation. And if we really wanted kind of global communities of knowledge, we need a wholly different kind of um, infrastructure. I think there's possibility, technical possibility for that, um, but it would mean different kinds of um, organizational structures to support it. Yeah, these are really interesting ideas. And I'm, I think obviously I haven't really been thinking about a new journal, as Emma said, I've got enough to do, but um, it's also thinking about, I think one of the elements that would be kind of interesting in terms of thinking about a new journal was would be about the way of setting up particular ways of working so kind of embedding ethical ways of working right at the outset of a journal and try to kind of think about that more radically thank you um harsh as well as like i'm passing on that question <laughs> i've got plenty of new journal activities on at the moment um, and I just just to say, I noticed in the chat that Bob Shoemaker has come back and said, well, you know, maybe we're, we're, we're too invested in the, the existing models of journals and some of the costs we're including and not really the cost of publication. And I, I mean, I, I mean, I also I, I'm having come to the end of a four year stint of editing historical journal. I am thoroughly jaded and not in the place um, at the moment to think about um, a new journal and more journal work. But I mean, you know, I think, you know, he may well be onto something. Maybe there is a completely different format out there and maybe that would be something fun to play with that is cheap and is durable um, and can be hosted cheaply. Um, we find actually open access isn't cheap. I mean, we work with our, our monographs and just hosting things, just it all costs money, but maybe there are completely different ways of doing it. Um, and maybe we are invested. I mean, because one of the things we haven't talked about very much is that um, journals have reputations um, and that those are very valuable to career enhancement. Um, and I guess it comes back to David Phillips' question as well um, about us being invested in it because these are the way our careers progress. But if we were to if we were to start again from a completely different place, if we were to start without any of this baggage, um, maybe it is a fun thought experiment. And, and, the, and the thing that would be different wouldn't necessarily be um, the content, but would be very much about the form um, and the availability of it might cover quite a lot of the things that have been raised today. Um, one other question I'd like to put to the panel um, before we go, and that is if you were to recommend one history journal article from your career as a reader, teacher or publisher, what would it be and why? And our, obviously our audience are here. If you want to pop things in your chat, your own suggestions, do feel free. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, I mean, I've actually chosen a, a collection of articles. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with a journal called Contemporary European History. Um, and this year I went to an in-person event that they hosted an in-person round table um, on the history wars, um, kind of the war on history. Um, and that was really fruitful for me as publisher to kind of see history being done um, was really, really kind of insightful and helpful. Um, and that collection will be publishing um, at the start of next year in that journal. Thanks, Georgia. Yeah, the impossibility of choosing one article, right? And so I, mean, I think there's, I'm going to be really naughty and, and suggest three, um, you know, Carolyn Steedman, something she calls, a th called a fever from the AHR in 2001 is still, you know, so useful, I think, in terms of thinking about kind of writing and historical work. 
Diana Patton's piece, Mary Williamson's letter from the transactions in 2019 is also really interesting in terms of working with a particular source and thinking about its different dynamics. And then very recently, um, Aruna Nima's um, data's were becoming visible travel documents and traveling eyes published in South Asian studies this year is also kind of brilliant for thinking about visual culture and visual sources and new ways of getting to history. I think three is absolutely appropriate, um, Kate, because as I say, we can find these articles so easily now. It seems silly to imagine there's just the one, you know, we are in the digital age and we don't work on, you know, you, you single units anymore. Um, Harshan or Karen, if you'd like to answer. Uh, the one I thought of was um, written in 1936 in the Eastern Review, and it was called um, Beware of Nehru the Dictator, and it was written by um, Nehru himself, um, but under a pseudonym of Chanakya, who's sometimes thought of as a precursor in some ways to Machiavelli, and I, I just found it fascinating, this introspection of attacking himself, but anonymously. And sometimes I feel I should do that to myself. Thank you, Harshan. <laughs> Karen? Oh, too, too many. I, I just thought of a, um, an article that I downloaded for about the 10th time recently. So it's an article by Jennifer Morgan uh, called Partis Sequitur Ventrum, Law, Race, and Reproduction in Colonial Society from Small Acts, the Journal of Caribbean Studies from 2018. And I thought about this just because Morgan's recent book is so brilliant and it builds on this essential article that's just been critical reading for so many people across fields since 2018, but also is really on my mind because when I downloaded it, my computer told me that I had like 10 versions of this article already downloaded. And I suppose that's a measure of um, how necessary it feels. Oh, and what, how, how far we have come from deliberating over whether to spend a few pounds over photocopying an article. We now have multiple copies all over our computer. Um, we've come full circle. All right. Well, with that, I would like to thank our panel um, very much indeed. It's been a very, very uh, rich and interesting discussion. I would love to thank our audience. Um, it's been an erudite conversation and I'm, I'm amazed that so many people have been kind of interested to join us and participate and um, learn more and, and, and contribute to our thoughts about journal publishing. It's been really wonderful. Thank you all very much indeed. And um, I wish you all a very good evening. Bye bye. <laughs>